In the far northern reaches of planet Earth lies an alien sea of ice, its waves frozen in time, in darkness, in uncompromising cold. It's winter on the Arctic Ocean. But a great power is returning to conquer this frozen sea. The sun's rays touch the ice, and like a living thing, it responds. As the ice surrenders to the rising sun, it becomes a world in motion, full of danger and drama. Where creatures are trapped between moving sheets, stranded on the frozen waters, caught in the struggle to live in one of the harshest places on Earth. And where the ice meets the open sea, the sun awakens a world of strange and glorious life. This is the Arctic under the sun, a short, brilliant season of survival, a miracle and a resurrection at the edge of the ice. After three months of winter's hard darkness, the first light of spring spreads a glow across the ice. It's dawn in the Arctic, in the season of eternal sun. A lone predator stalks the ice in the early light. A polar bear is on the prowl, indifferent to the killing cold. Even in temperatures of 50 below, he doesn't hibernate. The bear is the supreme master of winter on the ice. He can grow to 1,700 pounds of hunting power, but his life depends on one creature. The ring seal takes a quick breath and returns to his world below the ice. He too has endured all winter, just beneath the feet of his mortal enemy. It's April. A female is also on the ice, bringing her cubs out hunting for the first time. They were born four long months ago, and since then, their mothers had nothing to eat. Her sense of smell is so keen that she can detect her prey through several feet of snow and half a mile away. She seeks out ridges where drifting snow covers the breathing hole of a ring seal. Inside this protective snow cap, a seal has dug a lair. She catches his scent. The seal rests, but only sleeps a few seconds at a time, its sharp hearing tuned to danger. 
the tense contest of the senses begins. Even the top predator on the ice misses 19 times out of 20. And yet the mother bear will need to kill at least two seals a week to keep her cubs alive. The seal is safe for the moment, but each new trip to the surface to breathe could end in another ambush. It's an oversized game of cat and mouse. eats mostly the blubber, licking bits of fat from the snow. A stealthy white shadow has been following the bear. An arctic fox. For days, he's been tracking the great hunter, crossing miles of ice in hopes of leftovers from a kill. When hunting is good, the bear leaves a feast behind. The fox finds a morsel and buries it, a precaution against an unpredictable future. The sun now skims the horizon and will not set again for four months. Day by day, it begins to take control of the ice in the seasonal tug of war between darkness and light. But for nearly half the year, the far north is angled away from the sun and sleeps in the dark shadow of winter. Left in the deep freeze of space, the Arctic seas lie covered with six million square miles of ice. As the year progresses, the planet swings around the sun, light returns to the top of the world. With 24-hour sunshine, the polar ice begins to retreat. By spring, the ice edge has receded to a tangle of islands in the high Canadian Arctic and to the entrance of Lancaster Sound. Icebreaker cuts the first breach of the year through six feet of solid ice. It brings goods to and from villages and mining outposts 500 miles north of the Arctic Circle. For the ship, the ice is an obstacle. For some, it is home. The Inuit have carved life from this place for 4,000 years. The ice is their world, 
and spring promises a rich season of hunting ahead. The ice itself has been guarding a secret world. But now the crystal fortress begins to crack, its walls pierced by light. In the shallows 40 feet below, the sun reveals a garden of unexpected color. Golden sea anemones, bright orange starfish, and small crustaceans awaken from a winter trance. Overhead, the skylight of ice glows green with life. A vast pasture of algae now blooms on its surface spreading across the sea for hundreds of miles. Countless young fish and shrimp-like creatures come here to graze. These in turn become food for staggering numbers of Arctic cod. Protected by the shield of ice, some half million tons of cod flourish in Lancaster Sound. All this abundance is solar powered. As light floods the water, it sets off an explosion of life. Great stores of food can now be reached where the ice meets open water. Once beneath the waves, they're the Arctic version of a penguin. With short, flipper-like wings, they dive nearly 300 feet for three minutes at a time. On the way back up, air trapped in their feathers expands. They rocket to the surface in a jet trail of bubbles. At the ice edge nearby, a polar bear sensed the shifting wind. As though navigating by satellite, he continues to hunt across the same range, even as the ice turns into ocean. He's not above taking a bird or two, but the murs take no notice and prepare to leave, for they have an urgent appointment to keep. Timing is everything here, and the schedule is set by the sun. The murs head for land. The short breeding season has begun, and for those who come late, there'll be no second chance. Their destination is a lonely outpost in Lancaster Sound, the towering cliffs of Prince Leopold Island. Half a million seabirds crowd onto these rocky ledges, 1,000 feet above the sea. The murs alone number almost 200,000. Vicious fighting breaks out as the murs battle for the safest nest sites. They lay only a single egg, pear-shaped, to prevent it from rolling off the narrow rock shelf. The stronger, more aggressive birds win sights midway down the cliff, leaving the weaker birds at the top, where they're most vulnerable. 
An Arctic fox has been stranded here as the ice retreated from the island. His white winter fur has been replaced by a sleek brown coat. A castaway for the summer, he hunts alone on an island of birds. He heads for the cliff, the only place to find food on the island. Faced with a dangerous thief, the birds abandon their eggs. And though they can lay another, a late-season chick will not survive. The fox steals all the eggs he can reach, but he'll need dozens each week to stay alive. Some he stashes in the cold ground, there will be lean days ahead. It's June, a hundred miles from the island. A fleet of white whales has arrived at the ice edge. Belugas hunting for cod. The sea is suddenly alive with sound. This chirping white chorus emerges from feeding grounds beneath the frozen sea like a gathering of polar ghosts. With no dorsal fin to impede their icy travels, these are true Arctic whales. The beluga's rich symphony of sounds hints at the complexity of their lives. Their sonar may be the most sophisticated of any whale Navigating under miles of ice, they bounce clicks off shifting flows, using a kind of sound imaging to master their world. Their melodies pulse from their rounded foreheads, the frequencies fine-tuned like a focused beam of light piercing the blue depths. The bonds between them are strong. A mother and calf will swim side by side for three years. Shadowy gray at birth, they only gradually turn as perfectly white as the surrounding ice. The sun is riding high now. Strong winds from the open sea unleash their power against the ice. Beaten by wind and wave, weakened by sun and current, the ice fractures 
and begins to split apart. Immense cracks open behind the leading edge of the ice. These leads extend for miles, opening up new feeding areas and hunting grounds. The Inuit are experts at navigating the tricky ice fields of spring. It's a skill born of necessity, of the ancient need to hunt on this ever-changing surface. Olayok knows how to read the ice. Still, men and machines are sometimes lost. In the old days, entire hunting parties could disappear without a trace. They are now 60 miles from home. They are hoping the trip will end in a successful hunt, but it may take days. Not far away, one of the most aggressive animals in the Arctic falls out to rest. Adult walruses, heavily armored with tusks and skin that is one inch thick. The skulls are massive and backed by a body weighing one ton. They can bash through nine inches of ice. Out of the water, their only enemies are polar bears and human hunters. Walrus feed on vast beds of clams buried 200 feet below in the muddy sea floor. Each one can eat thousands of clams in a single meal. And the mud harbors less obvious but just as deadly predators. A carnivorous snail begins a slow, methodical attack. It smells the clam hiding in the mud and tries to penetrate the tightly closed shell. But the clam can defend itself with a strong kick from its single foot. Even stranger creatures patrol the dark ooze. They thrive in the near freezing waters of the Arctic, feeding on the remains of the dead and on each other. Overhead, the surface is warming up. Frozen salt water melts first, and from deep inside the ice, salty brine begins to drain away. Plumes of supercool, salty liquid spill downward out of holes in the ice, freezing the waters just beneath. Hollow stalactites build up around the draining brine, some reaching three feet in length. The waves continue to hammer at the ice, and the edge gives way under the relentless assault. Wind and strong currents push ice flows together. 
Massive blocks pile up and over each other, building miniature mountain ranges. In the wake of the shifting ice, giants come to feed. The bowhead whale is named for its great curving jaw, a favorite target of whalers. It has never recovered from two centuries of slaughter. Numbering only in the hundreds, bowheads in the Eastern Arctic make their last stand. Reaching 60 feet in length, it's the largest animal in the Arctic seas, yet the bowhead comes to feed on the smallest. Energized by the touch of the sun, the depths now pulse with millions of minute animals. They seem electrified. Their transparent bodies glimmer with iridescent light. More liquid than solid, these delicate drifters are miracles of survival wrapped in enchanting beauty. But to live here, they must also kill. A jelly trails its long tentacles, snaring a copepod then reeling it in to its death. These tiny hunters float in a world of their own. The sun is winning control of the ice, and the surface pools with meltwater. Temperatures now reach a balmy 40 degrees. Dripping water measures the fleeting season the sound of summer ticking away. Fresh leads break into the remaining ice. The Arctic's most intriguing creature moves in from the sea. The narwhal, with its ivory tusk, a living tooth up to 10 feet long. The whales converge along the narrow highway. This is what Olayuk has been looking for. Hunting is at the heart of the Inuit culture a way of life and skill still passed down from father to son. It's a proud link to the past and the only way to live off the land in the Arctic. Today, the Inuit are still allowed to hunt whales, but their take is strictly controlled. Yet Olayuk remembers the not-so-distant days when hunting meant the difference between life and death.
They've landed a female. Only males have a tusk. Whale skin is especially nutritious, high in vitamin C. Without such a diet, the Inuit would have suffered from the scurvy which plagued many Arctic expeditions. Eaten raw, it's a delicacy called muktuk. In the still twilight of midnight, the narwhals joust, a slow, stately ritual of mythic beasts. The purpose of their strange single tusk remains a mystery. Like the peacock's tail and the lion's mane, it may serve as a banner of male prowess. It could be a weapon, but it's the stuff of legend in the Middle Ages, the tusks were sold as unicorn horns for ten times their weight in gold. The sea ice is flooded now, although beneath the water, the ice is still several feet thick. Out on the melting surface, an abandoned ring seal has lost her bearings. She has wandered away from her breathing hole and cannot find her way back. Now she's trapped above the ice, an easy target for a hungry polar bear. And if she cannot return to the sea beneath her, she will starve. The young seal is now exhausted, but luck finally leads her to a hole in the ice. She is safe, but now she's in unknown territory, a long way from her familiar network of breathing holes. She won't stray far for a while. All around her, the ice is changing. The pasture of algae that once blanketed the surface has sloughed off and joined together in flowing ribbons of green. Long tendrils reach out to absorb light and nutrients from the passing currents. Then, suddenly, as unpredictably as it closed, the lead reopens. And the whales are free.
High off the cliffs of Prince Leopold Island, Fulmers and Kittiwakes ride the wild winds. Even gusts of 40 miles per hour present no problem for these aerial acrobats. Landing is the tricky part. There's new life in the Murr colony. The adult birds are busy flying back and forth to the sea, returning with cod for their young. The chick will need to triple its weight over the next three weeks and feeds round the clock in the constant daylight. At the top of the cliff, Glaucus gall chicks are hungry too. But gulls don't limit their diet to fish. This one goes hunting closer to home, looking for an unprotected chick. returns with a grizzly catch. For the fox, these are hungry times. Egg laying is over and the chicks have hatched out of his reach. He has only his store of buried eggs to see him through. High summer finally reaches the Arctic. The last remnants of ice swirl near the shores of Lancaster Sound. The frozen sea is broken at last, drifting in tattered pieces on the current. Moving inshore are the gleaming white shapes of belugas. They return by the hundreds to the same inlets they frequent each year. Their smooth white skin has turned yellow and wrinkled. It's time to molt. On the rocky bottom of the shallows, the whales scrape off their old, weathered skin with a rejuvenating rub.
Terns wheel overhead and dive for bits of molded skin. As the tide turns, the whales retreat into deeper water. But one young beluga has pushed too far inshore. The benevolent sun now becomes his greatest enemy. He could easily sunburn, and out of the cold water, he could overheat. The others can do nothing. The rocks have cut his sensitive skin. All he can do is wait for the incoming tide. With one last surge, the young beluga recovers his freedom. It's only August, but autumn is closing in on the Murr colony. The chicks are just three weeks old, still unable to fly. Yet the time has come to leave the island. Escorted by its father, the chick makes its way to a gauntlet of hostile adults still defending their ledges. <laughs> Driven by irresistible instinct, the chick prepares to make an incredible leap from the thousand-foot cliff. With his father close behind, he plummets to the waters below. For the next eight weeks, they'll drift southward as the young moors grow the feathers they'll need to finally take to the air. The fox is left alone. His stash of eggs is gone, and he may starve before he can escape the island.
The moon now looks down on Lancaster Sound, the cold, pale face of the coming winter. All across the Arctic, animals are on the move, fleeing the coming freeze. The cold is returning to claim these seas. The great bowheads depart as their food supply begins to dwindle in the fading light. Slowly, the surface begins to transform. Crystals congeal into grease ice, then thicken into pancake ice. The season of the sun is over. Soon, winter and the white bear will stalk the ice once more. Cold howls across the empty expanse of frozen sea. Darkness deepens. The bear settles in to stay. And the Arctic turns once more toward the dark night of space.